So dear students and dear online participants and dear colleagues as well, today uh, I have the pleasure to welcome also two professors of law here attending uh, the lecture in this environmental law lecture series. And this is already the eighth lecture to be delivered. And I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, which is Joanna Hajiani, who will talk to us from Cyprus. It is really great that we can use these new online possibilities and to have you, Joanna, as a lecturer far away from Maastricht, but feeling very close here on the big screen in the lecture hall. Joanna will introduce us to access to justice in environmental matters, a key topic in environmental law. And she will focus on access to justice at EU level. Dear Joanna, you can take the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure to join you online for this environmental law lecture series. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank Professor Peter for the kind invitation to deliver this lecture um, on a topic that I have long found fascinating and in which developments are always ongoing and topical. This lecture examines the scope of access to the Court of Justice of the European Union in environmental matters for challenging the legality of acts adopted by EU institutions and bodies. My talk will start by setting out the interplay between international law, particularly the Aarhus Convention, and EU law, focusing on the role of the court, which determines the internal effects of international agreements. Now, the presentation examines the effectiveness of judicial protection in environmental matters, which is meant to be ensured through a combination of remedies, which together provide a complete system of remedies. In examining the different, uh, different legal remedies, I'll be focusing on issues of standing, which ultimately determine who has access to justice to challenge regulatory power. In this context, I'll be drawing attention to the impact of Article 9.3 of the Aarhus Convention, which is limited in determining access to the Court of Justice directly under our Alman proceedings, but has influenced the revision of the Aarhus regulation. In the EU legal order, much emphasis has been placed on indirectly accessing the court through preliminary references by national courts, but this depends on actually having access to national courts in the first place. Now, at the international level, the Aarhus Convention, adopted in 1998 under the auspices of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, sets out general obligations for ensuring access to environmental information, public participation, and access to justice. Compliance with these obligations is overseen by the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee, which is an innovative compliance review mechanism before which members of the public including NGOs and other contracting parties may bring complaints. Since the establishment of the ACCC in 2002, it has issued a significant number of findings, including on the Convention Circular on Access to Justice. When we get to the EU legal order, depending on the situation, EU environmental law may be violated by EU institutions. For example, when the Commission authorizes an active substance to be used in pesticides, or on the other hand, by national authorities, when they authorize the construction of polluting industries in protected areas, for instance. Now, under EU law, the Aarhus Convention is considered a mixed agreement. That means that both the EU itself and the 27 member states are contracting parties and the court has confirmed that it has jurisdiction to interpret the Convention on Access to Justice also for the Member States, and even in relation to Article 9.3, which is a provision that can apply in situations falling within the scope of national law and to situations falling within the scope of EU law. The focus of today's lecture will be on the implications of uh, the provisions on access to justice and particularly Article 3, for the EU institutions and access to justice at the EU level. Starting from the relevant provision of the Aarhus Convention, Article 9.3 
establishes a general right to access to justice in the sense that it does not depend on the other two pillars on access to information and public participation. Now, what does Article 93 require? It requires parties to ensure that members of the public have access to judicial or administrative procedures to challenge violations of environmental law. And perhaps the most important and controversial aspect of Article 93 is that it allows certain discretion to parties to set criteria, usually relating to standing, in their national law, which may, which may qualify uh, such access. Now, the ACCC, in findings against uh, Denmark, uh, has clarified that Article 93 does not establish actio popularis in the sense that anyone can have access to courts, uh, but at the same time, it does not allow parties to establish criteria that are so strict uh, so that effectively they bar all or almost all environmental organizations or other members of the public from having uh, access. This reflects the underlying rationale of the convention, which is to guarantee access to justice and which the parties need to take into account when they set criteria in their national laws. Now, the requirements of Article 93 are supplemented by Article 94, which requires procedures under Article 9 to provide adequate and effective remedies, as well as be fair, equitable, timely, and not prohibitively expensive. In this context, the ACCC issued findings against the European Union, initially in 2011 and finally in 2017, for failing to comply with the requirements of Article 9.3 and 9.4, despite the multiple remedies provided for in EU law. In the European legal order, there are multiple avenues for putting Article 9.3 into effect, which are meant to work in combination like pieces to a puzzle to create a complete system of remedies. The first, most direct way of having access to judicial review before the Court of Justice is provided under Article 263, Paragraph 4 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and it is also the most restrictive. Standing requirements for non-privileged applicants, that means members of the public and NGOs, under Article 2634 have been interpreted narrowly particularly the requirement of individual concern, as the article says, has been consistently interpreted since 1963 in the Plowman case in a restrictive manner, which essentially requires an applicant to be affected in a way that differentiates them from all other persons, just as in the case of the person to which a decision is addressed. You can imagine that in environmental cases, where affected interests are usually of collective nature, this has led to different kinds of actors systematically being denied access to the court under Article 2634, as they do not usually form part of a closed, predetermined class. And this includes economic operators, residents in nearby areas of polluting activities, and NGOs. This approach was recently reaffirmed by the court in the case of SABO, a case concerning uh, an annulment proceedings against the EU's climate mitigation action. Confirming in this case uh, that individual concern is a test of intensity and not scope, essentially saying that the larger am amount of people affected, the less likely to have access to the court under Article 2634. And here we have a, a mention of intergenerational equity, basically, the fact that uh, the protection regulation of the environment says the court affects everyone in both current and future generation actually works against the notion of individual concern. As a response to some of the gaps created by the restrictive application of individual concern, a new avenue for direct access to the court was created by the Lisbon Treaty in the third leap of Article 2634. So, this establishes access to the court 
to non-privileged applicants when they're directly concerned by regulatory acts that do not entail any implementing measures. And it has been interpreted to cover only challenges to acts of general application that have not been adopted through a legislative procedure and only in situations where there is absence of any measure by the member state to put the regulatory act into operation even of a mechanical nature. In relation to environmental cases, the Lisbon test has not significantly altered the position of individuals and NGOs. Most environmental measures would not qualify as regulatory acts, not entailing implementing measures. Uh, most environmental measures are directives, which by nature often entail discretion and always require implementing measures. In any case, applicants still have to demonstrate direct concern under the Lisbon test, which requires the legal position of the applicant to be directly affected. Given the discretion embedded in environmental measures and that the damage caused may not be the direct result of EU action, applicants in environmental cases still face considerable obstacles. In the Sabo case, for instance, the damage caused to the applicants as a result of cutting down trees would be unlikely to be deemed a direct consequence of the EU's rules on the use of biomass, given the multiple causal events between the EU Act, the Member States' action to meet renewable energy targets, the increased demand for pellets, and the ultimate result on cutting of trees in the area where the applicants live. Overall, Different strategies have been used by individuals to change, to get the court to change its approach in environmental cases, but they have failed. Among these failed strategies is the attempt to use Article 9.3 of the Aarhus Convention. First of all, Article 9.3 has no direct effect in the EU legal order, says the court, in the sense of applicants being able to rely on it directly as a legality benchmark. Second, it has not been possible to take Article 9.3 into account by consistently interpreting Article 234. According to EU law, established EU law, international agreements uh, concluded by the Union bind the institutions and prevail over acts of secondary EU legislation, but they do not have primacy over treaty provisions. And in any case, the course considers that plowman is simply the criteria that the EU has decided to lay down as permitted by Article 93. In Sabo, the court concluded that despite the paramount importance of environmental action and the fact that a different system of remedies could be envisioned for challenging the legality of EU action on environmental matters, it's up to the member states to revise the treaties and not for it to change its interpretation. So shifting the responsibility to the drafters of the treaty potentially to create a separate environmental avenue for directly accessing the court. Apart from Article 9.3 of the Aarhus Conventions, of the Aarhus Convention, attempts to rely on the principle of effective judicial protection under EU law including its uh, recognition in Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, have also failed. With the court stressing again the hierarchy and the importance of following the treaties. In any case, in the eyes of the court, effective judicial protection does not equal unfettered access directly to the court but it is meant to be ensured through a combination of remedies, considering the annulment proceedings only to be one piece of the puzzle. On the contrary, the principle of effective judicial protection in combination with Article 93 has played a crucial role in the court's case law on access to national courts. And we'll come briefly back to this differentiation, which can be problematic towards the end of the presentation.
given the limited access, especially that environmental NGOs have through annulment proceedings. One of the main alternative avenues for access to justice for this type of applicants has been an administrative review procedure provided under the Aarhus Regulation. Article 10 established the procedure to request an internal review of administrative acts or omissions that contravene environmental law. Now, this is inherently of a different rate nature because the request for internal review is lodged with and examined by the institution or body that are adopted or should have adopted a specific act. So the review mechanism inherently raises concerns as to the impartiality, adequacy, fairness required by Article 9.4 of the Convention. In terms of its personal scope, the initial version of the AHUS regulation was very limited uh, only to environmental NGOs that had been active for at least two years in a member state. And in terms of its material scope, it excluded both legislative acts uh, and measures of general application. In practice, since its entry into force, 80% um, of the requests lodged with the Commission were found inadmissible. And from this, more than half of the requests made to the Commission were rejected because they were not considered to be of individual scope. So, for example, it excluded acts addressed to the member states, such as acts um, amending maximum residue levels of pesticides and Commission decisions authorizing derogations from the air quality directive. A very small number was considered admissible, for example, concerning authorizations of uh, placing on the market of genetically modified organs, uh, products and chemicals. Uh, but even those requests that were deemed admissible by the Commission, they were found not to violate environmental law. And usually this was on the basis of a very brief statement by the Commission disagreeing with interpretations suggested by the NGO that lodged the request. In fact, none of the requests lodged with the Commission have led to an act being revised or withdrawn. You can imagine that the material scope of the AHRQ's regulation was challenged before the Court of Justice multiple times on the basis of Article 9.3 and the court was not able to change uh, the material scope through interpretation. As mentioned already, Article 9.3 does not have direct effects, which means that it could not be used as a legality benchmark directly for reviewing the regulation. The court also refused to apply the so-called implementation principle that would have allowed a legality review. This principle, was developed in relation to WTO agreements, which do not have direct effect in the EU legal order. And according to this principle, it is possible to review the legality of EU law on the basis of an international agreement which does not have direct effect when the EU Act at issue explicitly refers to provisions of the agreement or it tends to implement a particular obligation of the EU under the international agreement. In refusing to apply this principle to the Aarhus Regulation, the court emphasized that the Aarhus Convention's obligation primarily fall on the member states. And any gaps in judicial protection should be filled at the national level. It was also not possible to broaden the scope of the regulation through consistent interpretation. The court says the regulation explicitly provides that acts are reviewable under the regulation have to be of individual scope. Interpreting this in a different way would amount to contra legem interpretation against the letter of the law and was not possible uh, through judicial interpretation. Interestingly, the court did not explicitly and meaningfully engage with the ACC findings on the AHUS regulation. Um, 
which clarified that, yes, we do have a caveat in Article 93 allowing for criteria to be imposed, but this does not leave discretion as to the kinds of acts that may be exempted by implementing laws. The fact that the court was reluctant to rely on the interpretation offered by the review body tasked under international law with overseeing compliance with this agreement, I think raises questions as to the EU's strict observance of international law, while at the same time that we see the court sort of trying to preserve political discretion uh, and allow the legislature to figure out the best way to comply with the ACC findings. So it's become clear that the solution would not come through judicial interpretation, and the legislature uh, was uh, uh, left to um, the option to change it if they wish uh, by revising the regulation, which they did in 2021. Now, before looking at the revised scope of the regulation, it is important to mention Article 12 of the Aquas Regulation, which establishes a limited avenue of access to the court for those environmental NGOs that have made requests under Article 10. The ACCC had clarified that an interpretation of Article 12 that would limit judicial review to the written reply given by the institution to the NGO under Article 10 would be contrary to the requirements of the convention of the convention. Nonetheless, the court subsequently confirmed that uh, it is limited. Article 12 does not allow for the substance of the original act to be reviewed by the court. So this means that a successful application under Article 12 cannot lead to the annulment of the initial act, which was challenged through Article 10 but only of the written reply that the institution gave to the NGO following the request under Article 10. And the standard of review applied by the court is not very demanding. It examines whether the relevant institution committed a manifest error of assessment in its reply. Now, in practice, indirectly, grounds of review that were relevant in the request for internal review may be examined by the court, but no new arguments may be put forward. This effectively means that NGOs wishing to challenge the legality of the initial act can only use the annulment procedure for acts not addressed to them under Article 2634, according to which they are likely to have standing as discussed earlier. Now, the material scope of judicial review under Article 12 remains largely unchanged in the 2021 revision of the regulation, apart from a recital um, in the preamble clarifying that it covers both the procedural and substantive legality of the written reply. Now, the scope of judicial review becomes clear when we look at the recent case decided by the Court of Justice in July 2023, which demonstrates, I think, that despite its limitation, the Office regulation offers promising accountability avenues. Now, this judgment uh, concerns interpretation of the Office regulation before its revision in 2021. That's when the request was made. And it is likely, however, that the reasoning of the court was implicitly influenced by the subsequent broadening of the regulation scope. The case concerned a request by an environmental NGO for internal review under Article 10 of, of a resolution by the Board of Directors of the European Investment Bank, which approved the financing of the construction of a biomass power plant in Spain. The EIB refused the request submitted by the NGO as inadmissible on the ground that it did not relate to an act amenable to internal review. In terms of the personal scope of the regulation, the court interpreted uh, 
the regulation consistently with the convention and clarify that only specific situations relating to a body acting in a judicial or legislative capacity or as an administrative review body under the EU treaty can be excluded. In the circumstances of the case, none of these exceptions applied. Beyond its classification as a public authority, the EIB sought to limit the scope of the regulation by arguing that its refusal to the request by client Earth was justified as a means to protect its independence on the financial markets. Now, Article 271, Paragraph C of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union sets out strict conditions for annulment proceedings against measures adopted by the EIB's Board of Directors, both in relation to the applicants that can bring such action, that's only the Commission and the Member States, and the scope of review, which is limited to grounds of non-compliance with procedures set out in the EIB statutes. Nonetheless, according to the court, this provision, Article 271, cannot limit the indirect review of EIB resolutions by the court, nor deprive environmental organizations from the right to request an internal review under Article 10 of the Aarhus Regulation, and the corresponding right to bring an action for annulment against a decision requesting the request under Article 12. In essence, the application of Article 12 of the Aarhus Regulation to AEIB resolutions does not directly expand the court's jurisdiction over AEIB measures, as its review can only lead to a decision requesting the AEIB to internally review the resolution itself and not to its annulment by the court. As we saw earlier, Article 12 review cannot lead to the annulment of the initial act. Finally, regarding the material scope of the regulation, both the Court of Justice and the General Court adopted a teleological approach of uh, the requirement for an act to be adopted under environmental law. The Aarhus Regulation, according to the Court, covers acts which can infringe environmental law and in this way contribute to the pursuit of objectives under Article 191 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. In this context, the EIB's climate strategy and the statement of environmental and social principles and standards, which require the EIB to take into account environmental criteria in determining the eligibility of projects, rendered the decision one taken under environmental law. This approach reflects the clarifications in the 2021 revision of, of the regulation, which cover acts adopted in the implementation of other non-environmental policies, which should be subject to internal review. In this context, the court indicated that when taking lending decisions, the EIB cannot, without justification, depart from the environmental criteria it set for itself in the climate strategy in the 20, 000, 20, 2009 statement of environmental and social principles. So it held that the EIB cannot unjustifiably depart or ignore these criteria without risking violating the principle of equal treatment or the protection of legitimate expectations. Now, moving to how the regulation was actually revised in 2021. Following the ACC findings against the EU for restrictive access to the court, the Commission and the Council stressed that they could not indicate to the Court of Justice how to interpret Article 2634. Separation of powers, judicial review, judicial interpretation is the exclusive jurisdiction of the court. Instead, one out of two ways for ensuring compliance with the Aarhus Convention was to expand the scope of the Aarhus Regulation, which they did in 2021. 
In terms of its personal scope, a significant step was achieved by the European Parliament and Council by extending uh, beyond NGOs to members of the public in two instances. The first is determined by qualitative criteria when there is impairment of rights, of rights caused by the alleged contravention of environmental law and when members of the public are directly affected in comparison with the public at large. Directly affected is not the same as individual and direct concern under Article 2634. This means that they're directly affected uh, in the comparison with the public at large, for example, in the case of an imminent threat to their own health or prejudice uh, caused to a right that they're entitled to under the law. The second instance is a combination of qualitative and quantitative criteria when there is a sufficient public interest in protecting the environment, human health, and so on, which is proven collectively as the request has to come from a minimum number of members of the public, 250 members of the public at least, from a minimum number of member states. Um, 4,000 members of the public, that's the minimum for the whole uh, um, uh, collective sort of uh, move, and then 250 have to come uh, from uh, each of five member states. So the, the, the criteria are quite high. It seems to be sort of be inspired by the European Citizens Initiative, um, and it's more of a collective standing approach. This broadened personal scope beyond NGOs um, only came into force in April 2023. There was some sort of uh, delay in allowing time to the administration to adapt to this broadened scope. And apart from the personal scope, the material scope was also extended. And this came in force already in 2021, uh, extending now beyond acts of individual scope and beyond acts adopted under the environmental legal basis, which essentially covers a larger portion of requests. Still, the material scope excludes commission decisions on state aid, which may contravene environmental law, as provided in Article 22A of the regulation. State aid decisions can be powerful instruments that affect the environment. They shape the EU's energy markets, they determine support to fossil fuels, renewable energy sources, and can have a direct impact on the balance between polluting and non-polluting industries on the market. State aid decisions already have to comply with EU environmental law and NGOs should be able to challenge the compatibility at EU level. Their, their exclusion from the scope has no basis in the Aarhus Convention, which only excludes acts adopted by public authorities acting in legislative or judicial capacities. In March 2021, the ACCC found against the EU for failing to provide access to justice to environmental NGOs against commission stated decisions, uh, requesting the e EU law, uh, recommending that EU law should be changed. With pressure from the EU, the meeting of the parties to the Aarhus Convention in its meeting in October 2021, postponed the possible endorsement of the findings to the next meeting in 2025, basically until the EU figures out how to comply with the uh, findings. In May 2023, following a public consultation, the Commission issued a communication which stresses that ensuring compliance with these ACC findings requires an adjustment to the existing legal framework or an equivalent measure. And the, in the communication, we, we have two key objectives. On the one hand, ensuring compliance with the Aarhus Convention and on the other, preserving the specificities of state aid control and its effectiveness as one of the tools that can speed up the green transition. How to find balance between the two is something that the Commission is currently considering. It's considering different options, including amending the Aarhus regulation to include state aid decisions 
but of course, we should bear in mind that administrative act that would be reviewable under the office regulation comes only at the final stage once the definitive decision actually exists in state aid proceedings. So it remains to be seen how and to what extent state aid decisions will be reviewable. Now, whether the broadened scope of the regulation will be sufficient to fill the gap and meaningfully comply with the Arts Convention remains to be determined in practice, but we do have some trends already visible that are quite telling. Before the revision of the regulation, we had 48 requests with the Commission since its entry into force uh, in 2007. After the revision in 2021, we have an additional 33 requests demonstrating an important increase in requests now that generally applicable acts are reviewable. Also, comparatively with pre-revision requests, a larger number are considered unfounded on substance rather than deemed in in inadmissible. So overall, there is more of a balance between unfounded and inadmissible um, requests at the moment. For example, a review request for of the fourth union list of projects of common interest, which are key cross-border energy infrastructure projects, was previously found inadmissible by the Commission. New lists from the fifth published in November 2021 always are, are now reviewable. We also have review requests to the Council, which now has an established public registry um, and an area of decisions subject to review by the Council yearly concern regulations fixing fishing opportunities, the so-called total allowable catches under the common fisheries policy. The focus of um, the substance reviews and of the judicial review under Article 12 seems to be on how relevant scientific evidence is being used by institutions. So applicants and geos frequently argue that the institution adopted an act breaching environmental law uh, because it has not sufficiently relied on the latest scientific evidence, the precautionary principle, and so on. To give you an example that is quite um, important, uh, two requests were made concerning the Commission's classification of energy source from biomass, uh, from forest biomass, as sustainable under the EU taxonomy for sustainable finance regulation. The Commission relied on the classification of forest biomass as a renewable energy source in EU legislation. Um, according to um, the NGO, without taking into account the most recent evidence showing the high level of greenhouse gas emissions incurred by burning forest biomass. And to this effect, a case was launched in April 2023, challenging the Commission's reply and its assessment to the NGOs. Now, it it remains to be seen how the general court will decide, but we should recall that it's settled case law that EU institutions have a wide margin of discretion in assessing scientific evidence, which is often quite complex. Judicial review is limited to examining whether the institution made a manifest error of assessment and exceeded the bounds of its discretion. And interestingly, in its written reply, the Commission really heavily emphasizes its discretion. So we'll see how um, the court approaches this kind of challenge. Finally, apart from the ARCUS regulation, the other remedy which is meant to compensate the restrictive access to the court under Article 2634 is by indirectly accessing the CJU through national courts, sending preliminary references on validity under Article 267 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Preliminary references on validity concern situations where in the course of an action before a national court, the legality of a relevant EU act is put to question. If the national court 
is inclined to find the validity challenge well-founded, then it has to send preliminary questions to the Court of Justice, which has exclusive jurisdiction to review the legality of EU acts. However, a national court may decide that it is not necessary to refer and instead hold that the EU Act is valid. So this means that this redress mechanism is an inherently different piece to the puzzle. It is not a legal right of action for the applicant who may ask the court to send questions to the Court of Justice, but it is ultimately a judicial decision whether to do so. And in light of this nature, the ACCC had ruled that it does not meet the requirements for securing the rights of Article 93 and does not compensate for the restrictive access to the court directly under Article 2634. Now, of course, there are many benefits to um, accessing national courts, um, the familiarity of applicants with the system, the language used, it's closer to the citizen for certain situations involving violations of environmental law by national authorities, authorization of individual projects in member states. But when it is about the legality of EU technical, technical and politically charged acts, access to the Court of Justice directly and throughout the whole cycle of the case is preferable as it involves a critical role by the general court and ensures a uniform system of review for violations by EU institutions that, that does not depend on procedural rules of different member states. In any case, to date, this avenue has not served a significant role in environmental cases. It's made a minimal contribution. Uh, since 1988, one, we have about 28 uh, occasions of preliminary references on validity in environmental issues coming from eight member states and usually involving economic operators as the applicants. We have one rare example by an environmental NGO, which is also one of the rare instances which led to the annulment of the commission decision. Um, and this can set the decision of the commission to authorize amendments to the list of sites of community importance under the habitats directive to reduce the size of a special area in the Netherlands. Overall, it is the less frequently used mechanism, both compared to the Aarhus Regulation and Article 2634. This may be partly explained um, by the reluctance of national courts to send preliminary questions on validity. And we should bear in mind that its use is also contingent on varying standing requirements for accessing national courts in the first place. On this front, the Court of Justice has played a crucial role. Even though we do not have specific EU secondary legislation implementing Article 93 for the member states. Outside of areas where we have EU secondary legislation, the starting point is that member states have procedural autonomy subject to national remedies not making it in practice impossible or excessively difficult to exercise rights conferred by EU law. In this context, partly on the basis of Article 93 of the Aarhus Convention and partly on the basis of EU law principles, the, the court has limited procedural autonomy in environmental matters to ensure wide access to justice, especially for environmental NGOs, as Professor Maria Magdalena Antonio will examine in next month's lecture. So I will leave that point uh, there and it will be further explored uh, in next month's lecture. So overall, to conclude, um, the court seems to insist on its longstanding rationale that effective judicial protection for environmental matters will be ensured through a combination of legal remedies that together amount to a complete system. Interestingly, it has also seems to have thrown the boat to the treaty makers, reiterating that it is up to the member states to revise the current system of remedies 
possibly by creating an environmental avenue of access to justice under the treaty. Until then, the alternative avenues under the Aarhus regulation and access to national courts, which can lead to preliminary references on validity, remain pivotal. Preliminary references on validity, in light of their different nature as a mechanism and the rare use in practice, do not seem to offer the panacea to the EU's shortcomings for guaranteeing access to justice that both the court and the commission make it out to be. Ensuring that procedural rules in the 27 member states do not preclude access to the national court, which can then lead to a preliminary reference on validity, will not happen overnight. And within, within this context, the importance of the Aarhus regulation as a key piece to the puzzle of legal remedies becomes even more visible. Now that both its personal and material scope have been broadened, we await to see its full potential uh, manifesting in practice even further. Thank you so much uh, for listening and I look forward to any questions and discussion that will follow.